Hello, welcome to the very first Green Sofa Dialogue brought to you by the Berlin Energy Transition Dialogue. I am joined today by Meshthild Wörsdörfer, who is the Director of Sustainability, Technology and Outlooks at the International Energy Agency. Hello, Meshthild, welcome. It's lovely to have you with us. Hello, Jennifer. Nice to meet you. And I am also very pleased that we have Andreas Gandolfo, who is coming to us uh, as the team leader for the European Power Transition Team at Bloomberg Neff. Hello, Andreas, and welcome. Hi, thank you for having me. Thank you both so, so very much for joining today. I'd like to get started right off with our main question. Will the growth in renewables be positively or negatively impacted by this COVID-19 crisis? Who would like to start? Mesthild? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, this is certainly an important question. Uh, let me just say on the current COVID crisis, it's something we had never experienced, certainly for, from a health point of view, from an economic point of view, but also from an energy point of view. We have more than 4.2 billion people who are subject to complete or partial lockdown in more than 185 countries. So this partial or full lockdown has impacted enormously the first quarter, including April, our data goes to end April and uh, beginning of May, energy demand. So energy demand has been falling in the month of April by 50% globally. So this is something we had never experienced. It's uh, the, the whole energy system, the fall in energy demand is the highest in the last 70 years, seven zero. So we, since the second world war, basically, we hadn't had that decline in energy demand. So, and that also has an impact on electricity demand and all the fuels. So uh, electricity uh, demand in those countries who had the full lockdown, like here in France and in some other parts of Europe, we can say there had been daily uh, re reduction of 20, 25%. And uh, in other region, maybe a bit less where there was a partial lockdown, but that affects all fuels. So as demand is falling, we could see all fuels but renewables who are falling in, in this first month of uh, COVID-19 and with our estimation for 2020. So we saw a sharp decline of oil, basically related to transport, 60% of the oil is used in transport, mobility is down. Then we saw a decline in gas, in uh, nuclear, in coal as well. But the only uh, energy sources which has not seen a fall but a slight um, growth is renewables. It's basically because they are cheap and they are prior prioritized in most power systems. So I will stop here, but I think uh, given the overall dramatic situation, uh, as I said, we have never seen that in the energy system since 70 years. Renewables so far, compared to other fuels in this dra dramatic situation, are better off than oil, gas and other fuels. Andreas, I want to direct a question, the same question to you in just a second. Meshtub, when we talk about these renewables, do we know which are experiencing the least downturn? Are we talking about solar? Is still as strong as it was? Obviously, we're heading into the summer in, here in the Northern Hemisphere. How are there specific sectors of renewables that are just as strong as they were or are perhaps stronger? I think the, I mean, it's, it's all a bit uncertain, but we released, uh, the IEA released today a renewables report trying to do an estimate for 2020, 2021. And there, I would say, as I said before, renewables as such are quite resilient to the crisis. Nevertheless, there had been a slowdown in new capacity, certainly in 2020, and that affects all renewables. And I would say here, we hope that in 2021, the projects which are delayed uh, because of uh, problems in the supply chain or some financial issues or just social uh, distancing also for the workers, that this slowdown in the new capacity in renewables worldwide will hopefully get up. In terms of who's affected most, I would say the distributed solar, the smaller projects, 
which are the households, the SMEs, the small and medium-sized business. We see slightly less affected wind, onshore wind and offshore wind, the big projects, as well as we can see it now. They will either be done, those who are already um, being planned and started, or with a slight delay will rebound next year. So the big offshore wind, onshore wind. Let me just finish with biofuels. As I said before, the transport sector had been hit very hard, aviation, but also road transport. And that would mean it's not only diesel and gasoline, but also biofuels. So biofuels is also hit by the prices. So Andreas, uh, to start us off, the same question for you. Will growth in renewables be positively or negatively impacted by this crisis? So um, from, from the perspective, let's say that we are seeing it at BNF and, and the market, um, I'd say that, you know, as, as Michelle said, um, in the early days, obviously the big question is, um, who suffered less and you know was there winning I, I want to add a little detail though like it's an asterisk that in Europe at least we're, we're seeing it we're seeing renewables not suffer it's obviously because they've had subsidies um, and they have obviously helped them a lot right because it's one thing to generate uh, and get paid 50 euros per megawatt hour but at the current prices of 15 or, or 20 or 30 it, it's a very big loss in income that uh, a lot of these, all of these projects essentially around Europe are making up with subsidies. Um, however, going forward, I think we are at the point where um, policymakers have a very big opportunity to say, hey, we know you're all shaken. Uh, we know everyone is kind of like worried about how long this crisis will last. Um, here it is. Our plan to come out of this crisis will include renewables. Let's emulate the success, let's say, to a certain extent of the 2010 financial crisis, 2009-2010 financial crisis by saying, let's make these assets safe for investors to go in. And the moment you do that, I know a lot of people are saying, oh, but are you calling for more subsidies? 10 years ago, I would have agreed that, yes, I'm most probably calling for more subsidies. Today, if you look at where subsidies are clearing, and in some cases, like in Spain, for example, we're seeing auction prices coming in below our market prices. Um, in Germany, we've had zero subsidy win, not 100% zero subsidy. Of course, there are some um, incentives going in behind it, but, but the, the head figure was zero. Um, if, if you take that into consideration, essentially what investors are saying is, you're asking us to go into a 20 year project. We want some certainty, right? We, we, we can't bet on volatility uh, to build something so long. And, but the moment you do that, you see that like pension funds go in and they say, okay, this is now something we can invest in. Bond yields are low, uh, we can do that. So I would say that, especially when I look at Europe, um, I think it is a question of will policy um, have the, the ability to A, say we need to do this and, and B, do it in a smart way, do it in a way that um, well, do it like we've seen some countries do it, essentially saying like, okay, we're going to give you a difference on the price, we're going to agree on some things, we're not going to overpay you, we're not going to underpay you, we're going to give you the certainty you need to be able to go out there and raise capital. And, and in fact, it, it is very important to, to secure cheap capital for renewables because when you look at the project, uh, essentially, um, we have a chart that being that shows like 50-60% of costs for uh, a wind project or a, or a solar project end up coming from financing costs because they compound, because you, know, you include the debt, you include the equity, all of these things end up uh, adding up a lot. Uh, and so lowering that by creating certainty is, is gonna be important and it's gonna be key to how renewables fare uh, once this crisis is over. So to, to come off of this, are there any specific measures that we can take to make sure that clean energy transitions are at the center of economic recovery and stimulus plans? Andreas? Uh, so, I, you know, obviously there's a short term uh, auction pipeline uh, around Europe that, you know, depending on level, I'm trying, trying to think of like the key countries, right? You think UK, Germany, um, France, Italy, Spain, depending a little bit on the country, you get something between two and five years uh, view. Um, I'd say 
right now, one good thing to do is A, commit to those, which we've already seen. You know, no one has said we're, we're going to reduce the ambition. Uh, B is potentially increase allocated volume, not for the near-term auctions. That it's almost useless to allo to increase the volume for the near-term auctions. I don't think you'll have enough necessarily have enough projects uh, ready to bid in them. But for the later ones, um, definitely do that. The second thing that around Europe, at least, we see is necessary is we need to have a discussion around onshore wind, um, and and you know is. I come from you know, a country where there's a very big discussion around onshore wind. Should we be building it on islands or not? And you get the locals who are saying, well, you know, they destroy the island scenery, uh, but then you get the people who are thinking about the energy transition and they say, well, you know, if everyone acts like this, then we don't build onshore wind anywhere. And you look at it right now and it's, it is the technology of choice. So uh, I think there needs to be a discussion um, between communities and, um, developers and environmental or energy departments so that we can have an understanding on, on, okay, how can we make it so that we can increase the number of sites, but also decrease the locational uh, issues that it causes. And, you know, coming from the renewable world, obviously I always think, well, put into perspective what a lignite power plant region suffers from and help the places that you're trying to install onshore wind understand the trade-offs. Um, so for the Greek islands, it's like, well, if, if we all act like this in 15 years, we don't have a Greek island because Greece, for example, starts to become too hot to go out in the day. Uh, the, the beaches start to recede, the, the weather becomes too extreme. And, 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 and I think if communities start understanding this, we're gonna have an unlocking of, of new sites but they also need to be compensated uh, accordingly. So, so I think the, the schemes where they try to include everyone who's affected by a new plan should, um, politicians around Europe should look into reinforcing them and, and pick best practices. Meshtilt, I saw you looking a few times there intently. Would you like to respond as well? Yeah, thank you very much. I think um, obviously the COVID crisis have set the minds of the governments to immediate action in the health sector and economy growth. So unfortunately, or it's harder, I think, to reattract all the attention from the governments for clean energy transitions and uh, climate change. But that should come. And I fully agree to Andreas, the governments have a really strong role. I mean, uh, the governments need to make sure that the confidence is there that the supply chain are working, that the project which are delayed on hold are boosted up next this year and next year. And I think what works probably best because we have to link even more the fact that we need to create jobs because that is the, the, the crisis right now. And there are a lot of uh, job losses or at least short time workers with the measures in the energy clean energy sector which have uh, the potential to increase growth and CO2 reduction. And I think renewables are very well placed there. I mean, we, we see solar, wind, offshore wind, as I said, bigger projects should continue, but we need the government's focus on clean energy transition, a reminder that we need a sustainable re recovery, learn from the mistakes in 2008, 2009, where we saw that CO2 emissions went down dramatically in 2009, but they increased four times in 2010, it was the largest year over year increase in 2010. So as we are experiencing, and our estimation in the IA is that we might have up to nearly 8% CO2 uh, emission reduction this year, it's not structural, it's, it's, it's linked to the hold of the economy, to the measures. So we, the government's role is really absolutely key to, to make sure um, clean energy transition, renewables, energy efficiency is another sector where there's a lot of jobs involved, that this is the top priority. And we as the agency and other actors need to give the data, need to advise the governments what are the rules for uh, having both job creation, clean energy transition, and economic growth, 
in the near term, but also keeping in mind, obviously, the longer term. So as we work towards this, does the, does the COVID-19 crisis, does it reinforce the importance of sustainable energy transition? Can we use this crisis right now to explain why we have to work harder with governments and get governments to work harder? Meshut? I think it's, um, it's quite tough right now. I mean, it, we had been in the beginning of the year, uh, there was a strong movement on clean energy transition, the EU Green Deal, a couple of other parts uh, in the world have really set the, the agenda. COVID, as I said before, the minds of the government are in the immediate crisis and the jobs. So I think it's harder to make the case for clean energy transition. I think all the good arguments from before the crisis are certainly there, but we had, as I said, uh, the government struggle, uh, the finance issue, the investment issue, all that come together. So uh, I think it will be harder, but it's absolutely necessary or even more so to make these structural changes which had been planned which are even more needed now. So the, the, I would reinforce government's role in this transition and also the need to step it up when they come to recovery. And as we call it, sustainable, green, secure recovery in the energy field must be top of the, of the mind uh, of all the governments. I don't know how it is. Well, I've read a little bit about Paris. I don't know what it's like in Athens. Here in Berlin, they have taken to putting these pop-up bike lanes everywhere. It's something that cities that has not been able to happen in Berlin at all. And sort of on the micro level, not on a governmental level, but on a on a very micro level, looking to find, OK, cycling is more sustainable. Let's find ways. Now we're using this crisis to, to make things happen in a way that we haven't before. Do you see that happening in Athens or in Paris? Unfortunately, because um, Michelle, you were talking earlier about how there's a temporary reduction in emissions and you expect a rebound. And that's when I thought um, terribly in Athens, because now half the seats on the bus are blocked off to keep social distancing and half the seats on the Metro are blocked off to keep social distancing. In fact, you see higher traffic on the streets. Now I understand that just like the drop in emissions is temporary, the increase uh, in emissions from this is also temporary, but, but there is a, you know, there is a tendency if people leave public transport, they don't come back to it. So I'd say my first experience, at least from Athens, which is not a city oriented towards biking, it has a lot of hills, it doesn't have bike lanes. At least from Athens, though, my, my first experience is it actually has the potential to increase car driving and reduce um, um, reduce public transport use. However, that said, you go to other places and uh, you go to a place like London because I have you know, my colleagues and I'm actually based in London even though I'm temporarily here. Uh, and they say, oh yeah, I signed up to a bike ship because now I, you know, I don't want to use Uber or taxi service. I don't want to use the bus. Uh, and so, because it's hard to have a car in London, everyone's resorting to these, um, these mechanisms. So I'd, I'd say whatever there is, um, sustainable mobility in place and there is a network that is that beats, let's say, the cost of having a car and, uh, and can compete with public transport, then there you could expect a, a shift. But wherever you have the choice of public transport or a car, which is quite a few cities around Europe, I'd say probably this crisis could result in higher car use. As we're seeing this momentum sort of, uh, you know, on a, on a local level, is there any way to, going back to what you were saying also, Meshtild, is there any way to, to maintain or even accelerate some of this transition momentum that we've built up and maybe can use this opportunity now to, to even further build up? Yeah, let me just uh, come back to your interesting question about Paris. Yes, uh, Paris, I think it's a good example. First, the bad thing was that we were uh, confined very strictly for two months. I mean, we couldn't go out more than one hour in a radius of one kilometer uh, with a document. So that was very tough. Now there is a huge policy to increase biking uh, in Paris. And frankly, personally, I'm, I'm using my bike also already before the crisis. 
Uh, I've seen big steps in more bike lanes. I was uh, in the city because now since a week we, we can travel a bit more and go out a bit more. There are Rue de Rivoli, which is a big street um, in the middle of Paris, is now fully for bikes. I don't know if that is temporary or fully. On the Seine, there are bike lanes. So the increase of biking in Paris is very visible. It started, by the way, already in December, January, when there was this general strike of public transport. And it has been maintained. We have been looking at it. The bike rate, I think, from last year's summer till now in Paris, as, a, as an example, has increased by 20%. And I'm personally quite sure that will be sustainable also after the COVID crisis, because it's just uh, uh, the city has turned much more bike lines. And it's, it's a city also which is uh, favorable because there are not huge uh, uh, mountains or whatever. It's, it's quite flat city. So that is on the positive side. And on the behavioral change in, in, in general now from the COVID crisis uh, and in Paris as well, I think there is on the downside also more traffic, personal cars, because people are afraid uh, of using public transport. So since a week, I see more bikes, but I also see much more private cars on the street again, uh, even though still, those people who can are tailor working like myself, but others who, who can't tailor work and who have a car, they're using their car more because they don't want public transport. So with time, we will see what are the beneficials of having more bike and urban mobility and the down other trend of using your own car because being afraid of public uh, sector, uh, public transport. Andreas, I know that you have some slides and I wanted to see if you wanted to talk about those. I wasn't sure exactly where they would fit. So, so I want to make sure that we don't um, miss our chance to look at them. Um, I have one or two more questions for you, but I also want to be sensitive to your time commitments today. So, so the, the two slides I sent essentially go back to the beginning of the discussion and, and they, they're just meant to show how policy um, can affect the, the outlook for renewables, right? So um, the, the two slides um, that I'm thinking about is one shows like what an, an unfavorable policy scenario would mean for renewables. And we focused on Europe. This is like a big project that we did within BNF the moment the, the crisis become, the, uh, the, gross, the crisis begun. And, and essentially we said, okay, well, the two key parameters that are within policymakers' hands right now uh, in Europe is A, the carbon price uh, and B, financing costs for Europe. And we already talked about how financing costs can change uh, by creating certainty or removing certainty. And so in the two scenarios that we examined, in, in one we said, okay, the policymakers go all out, they um, give out these subsidies. And um, I, think, I think there's a very strong argument in favor of them because of the way they're paid, um, because of the way that um, you know, they're settled. Essentially, uh, if, if the power price is high, then you're not really paying out money. So you're creating certainty and you're creating, going back to the question of jobs, you're creating jobs by like driving investment and building projects, but you're not really paying out. If power prices collapse for some reason and you need to pay out quite a significant amount to these projects, at the same time, you are gaining from the net effect of having low power prices. This, the second part of the argument is obviously valid for as long as, those projects represent a small part of your total, let's say, generation. But if, you know, right now with low gas prices, for example, if you think about it, everyone's paying a low power price. And, uh, and yes, you're topping up this subsection, but, but the entire cost is, is low. Now on the carbon side, um, you know, it, it is a purely political mechanism. It is supplies determined by policymakers. We saw what happened during the financial crisis when everyone was bickering about supply and prices were staying below 10 euros per ton. Now prices have uh, remained um, surprisingly high. Uh, right before the crisis, we're at around 25 euros per ton. We collapsed at below 20 uh, as some panic selling was going on. And, and now we've settled, I, I haven't checked today's price, but around I, I understand 22 euros per ton. Uh, that's what we're, where we're hovering. However, our understanding is that we are one announcement away from you know, the whole thing unraveling. 
uh, or, or going up. Uh, and so I know there are like a few reviews right now going on. I know there is the, the linear reduction factor review uh, that is due in a couple of years. Uh, there's also the MSR, um, so the market stability review, the injection rate. The, uh, they wanted to bring uh, that down and now they're considering maybe to keep it up at high levels so that they can uh, keep prices up. And I think that's one, la one other part where policymakers have a big opportunity to uh, make a difference by, because this essentially makes sure that it sends one more signal to the renewable industry that you know, we're serious about uh, decarbonization. It is also one of the hardest ones to sell right now in Europe because it's, let's say, the one policy tool that policymakers have that is counter-cyclical. You are boosting power prices by boosting carbon prices. And so our big counter argument to that is, well, any proceeds you raise from selling allowances you know, make sure, reinvest them. I, I really like, uh, Michelle, I really like your idea about energy efficiency. And in fact, we call it carbon efficiency, right? Like pay people to switch to carbon efficient systems, whether that's lowering energy use or switching a gas boiler to an electric heater or, or anything like that. The, we've seen that it's a labor intensive industry um, that requires training and requires people to go out and do things. It also requires parts, so it does have a, a, a multiplier effect. Uh, the, the energy efficiency. Then there is the weaker argument. You know, it hasn't really been proven. It's always there in the that you have uh, energy savings that then can be used towards other things. But uh, we really haven't seen evidence of that. I I want to ask Meshtild. Yeah, tell me what your thoughts are here about this, about what Andreas just said. Okay, I, I mean, I first of all fully agree on the importance on the finance and the carbon price, what um, Andreas just mentioned. Uh, the EU is certainly leading in a many sense in that uh, European Green Deal, as we mentioned, uh, the ETS, the emission trading system, and uh, other proposals which are coming out of the European Green Deal with high ambition and net zero target for 2050. Let me just add that the EU, I've been working myself 20 years in Brussels, is very much uh, leading that debate, but EU has roughly 8% of the global CO2 emissions uh, without the UK. With the UK, it was 9%. So we have to look also a little bit on the international global context when we speak about clean energy transition and what's happening. And on the renewable side, there's some positive signal also outside Europe. I mean, and uh, let me just add that, for example, China, who plays a huge role when it comes to clean energy transition, climate change, emissions, uh, and what China is doing. So they ha still have uh, a rising CO2 emissions, but they're also investing more and more in renewables. And they have, uh, for next year, two mega hydropower projects in China, which would then certainly push the renewables uh, also in, in other parts than Europe. And I think um, this is important to, to understand that whatever we do in Europe is hugely important, but we have to look what other parts of the world are doing, uh, Asia, South America, um, North America. And there are certainly some others who are also wanting to do net zero and work on renewables, energy efficiency, but there are others we need to push. And Europe can lead there also by its technologies, by its industries. Thank you. Um, I have one last question for the both of you that I would love to address. Uh, Andreas, I'll ask you first. How can we minimize the harmful effects of the crisis on the fight against climate change? Oh. <laughs> That's a... Uh... That's a tough question. It's a tough question. Um, I think, I think the, 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 this is very personal, but what the COVID-19 crisis showed me is uh, what happens when you ignore the experts, right? Like, no, I think the most, one of the most famous videos we've seen going around during the coronavirus crisis is Bill Gates saying, hey guys, this is coming. Uh, you, you know, it only costs you like, 
half a billion dollars a year to prepare for a global glo for a virus spreading globally and killing about five to ten percent of whom it infects. Um, so I, I, I think right now um, what I'm seeing missing, even in Europe, which is like leading, is education. And you know, I, I still see people in Europe who are like, I recycle cans. So it's okay that I drive my car to go to the store that's five minutes walking from here, right? I'm like, no, no, like, so I think what we should take away from this crisis is that just like we failed to educate people that, hey, a, 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 big, corona, a big viral crisis can have this kind of effects. Maybe we need to like learn from this and go out there and, and find a way to tell people that, hey, just like that happened, a lot of people knew about it. A lot of people told us about it. We did nothing, or most of us did nothing. Some countries did something. No. Similarly, you know, here's one other crisis that a lot of people have been telling us for a lot of years that it's coming, and let's do something. And I think that's the big thing that we can capitalize on from this crisis. Um, the, the, the cost trajectory for renewables will go on. The, the, the industry will switch at its own pace slowly. So what I see missing is people understanding how big of a problem this is and what a taste of that problem we got right now. And, and so I'd say that's probably the, the, the biggest threat that this opportunity posed um, uncaptured and, and lost. Meshthild, same question to you. How can we minimize the harmful effects of the COVID-19 crisis on the fight against climate change? I also think it's a tough question. Um, but <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I, I think what we experience in the COVID-19 crisis um, is certainly dramatic, as I said, and we will see a, a reduction in CO2 emission, which we haven't seen for, for many years. Uh, but it's not structural. So I think what we, what we can learn that when we focus on certain areas like transport, industry, power sector is decarbonizing uh, quicker. As we spoke about, renewables are getting cheaper, competitive uh, in most parts, and energy efficiency needs a boost. But I'm mostly worried to learn from the crisis also in other areas like transport and industry. So transport has seen dramatic changes. Um, road transport has been down by 50 to 75% in most parts of the world and aviation even harder. I mean, in some, in Europe, aviation had been nearly come to a halt. I mean, 90% uh, less. What can we learn about it? I think both governments and people can learn about it. Governments have a role to push climate change, to keep it on the agenda and to make the recovery packages sustainable clean at the same time uh, as, as uh, relevant for the economy. As a person, I think we can also change our habits. I mean, we can go more by biking, we can reflect if we need to do all the mission. I've been personally traveling quite a lot for my job, like many others, I imagine. Can we do more video conferencing? Can we do less business trips? If I stay with aviation, there is a debate right now what to do with the airlines who have major, major problems. Air France, the French government wants to give support, but probably under certain conditions. For example, no in, uh, inside France flights anymore. That should be reduced if not stopped and trains and others should uh, replace it. There is a similar debate in, in Germany and in other parts. So I think learning from the crisis can give ideas for the governments to learn from mistakes, to work in the transport sector, to learn in other sectors like industry, and not to repeat and do everything necessary only with the economy and jobs in mind. It may, needs to make the link to the climate change and clean energy transition. And on a personal basis, even the shock has been dramatic, the restriction has been dramatic. I think we need all of us to learn to change behavior. I mean, we are analyzing these different things in a report which comes out from the IEA in June, how much behavioral change will, will contribute to climate change. 
it's very tough. I mean, uh, but uh, I think we should all look at it. And Europe here, I think there are some good examples. That's fantastic. Thank you both very much. Uh, is there anything that I that either one of you would like to say? Anything else that you didn't get to touch upon during our conversation today? Maybe one point in our discussion, which didn't come up maybe strong enough, where I believe there is also a huge potential is in the whole area of innovation and technologies. I mean, we spoke about renewables, energy efficiency, carbon pricing, finance, but I think a push in innovation and technologies and a scale up of those which are existing right now, but are still costly, there I think there could be a role for governments to invest. I mean, I know in Europe, hydro, not only in Europe, hydrogen and green hydrogen, renewables, uh, wind and solar to, to produce hydrogen, which has multiple uses um, in, in, in transport, in power, in, in industry. That could be something I think uh, should, uh, which could be part of the recovery and the thinking of the governments. Because as I said, this is something which is still quite costly, but we know in the medium to long term, that can have a uh, positive impact on, on climate change and clean energy transition. It's just one example, there are other examples. My message is basically not to forget innovation and technology, even if the benefits is not tomorrow and most governments are looking for solutions for tomorrow and after, after tomorrow, but uh, to, to use the, the huge amount of money which is now being spent also to scale up um, promising technology, existing technologies, uh, innovation uh, in the clean energy sector could help, uh, certainly in the recovery and the economic growth and the climate change. Meshtilt, I really enjoyed that you brought up hydrogen in our next Green Sofa Dialogue. We're going to be touching on hydrogen so this is and green hydrogen, so it's fantastic that you mentioned this today. One last thing about Please. the hydrogen thing that you said earlier, Meshtilt. Uh, we looked at it and to be honest, like, of course, I, I agree with you, right? Like, we shouldn't forget about those technologies. The one big thing that, because we've been talking to, like, policymakers, especially around Europe and stuff, and everyone has the same problem that we have. It's like, how do you go telling someone who's making, I don't know, six, seven, eight hundred euros a month at a bar that part of the recovery package is going to go to an engineer who probably had a job, and, uh, and now uh, you're going to take that engineer and give him another job, which is developing a technology that's going to pay out in 20 and 30 years time. So while I agree with you that we shouldn't forget about innovation, we, strug we struggle internally. And this is not BNF's role, right? So we don't do this kind of thing. But we struggled on the packaging. Like how, how do you explain that to the average person who says, you know, that isn't really helping um, and I, I, it's just a thought that, that we had around hydrogen and, and these kind of new projects. And we, we get the feeling that it's shared. And I know I shouldn't go, like, I think that the answer is, how do you address this question rather than just don't do it? Yeah, I think about hydrogen, we can discuss our technologies. As I say, the main focus now for governments is job creation uh, and find the right way back and, and growth in the uh, economy. But there's a huge amount of money uh, which will be spent at EU level, uh, at national level. And I think we should not forget that part of that money should go in promising technologies. And there are a couple where we, where we know they can be useful in sectors which are what we call hard to abate which we cannot electrify, and that is either heavy industries or some parts of transport. And I believe that with part of the money, and I, I agree, it, it's not the solution for many of the problems we have now. Mm. My point is more that if we want to have net zero and if we want to have a clean energy transitions, we should not forget that for some sectors, there are no solutions on the table right now. So we need to invest those uh, in those sectors with part of the money for the future and hydrogen out of renewables is one possibility. There are certainly others uh, where we need to invest in, in storage and batteries and all that. So I wanted just to highlight that this 
medium to longer term investment shouldn't be forgotten because we need to, to recover in the long run and we need to keep that transition in all the parts um, on, uh, on our, as our priority. Thank you so very much, Andreas and Meshild, for joining me today for our very first dialogue. Um, I look forward to continuing this conversation again, and I wish you both a lovely afternoon. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jennifer. Thank you, Andreas. See Thank you, Michelle. Bye. Bye. Ciao.